We're going to go back to our sermon series in the book of Exodus uh, with a focus on the Ten Commandments or the Ten Statements. Uh, if you missed any of the sermons in this mini-series, go back and check our Facebook page and watch the ones that you've missed. Uh, some of them might also be in the YouTube uh, channel. So we are four statements away from finishing our mini-series on the Decalogue. Uh, we took up the sixth statement the last time we were here and the command that says, you shall not murder. Uh, and it's very, very significant right now. It's very relevant right now with what's happening in the Middle East. Uh, if you remember what I said about this command, the Hebrew literally says that this command as don't kill. Um, but I mentioned that there's more to this command than just not taking a life. Uh, biblically speaking, this can't be an accurate interpretation for this command because there are instances in the Bible that justifies killing. And I said, um, one of it is war. Uh, so, uh, I mentioned the last time I was here, the better translation for this commandment should be, you shall not kill unlawfully. Now, unfortunately, when there's war, there will be unlawful deaths. You can't avoid it. One of the commentators on, I think it was CNN or uh, BBC, said that, have you ever witnessed a war where, where there were no civilian casualties? Never. It's always going to be that way. That's what war does, right? That's why God doesn't, doesn't want to do it. He, he, he hates it. Uh, but it's the cause of sin that um, you know, gets these civilians, innocent civilians, um, killed um, so when we look at that translation you shall not kill unlawfully uh, it is more biblical to say that uh, because uh, for the main purpose of this commandment the commandment uh, the don't kill what's the main purpose uh, for this commandment to not kill unlawfully uh, main purpose I mentioned was the preservation of human life uh, not only that God's sovereignty over life and death so ultimately, the determining factor whether a killing was lawful and un or unlawful is God. So this means that God has final say on whether a person lives or dies. And whatever God decides is lawful. So even, I mean, it's hard to say this, but even some of the civilians that died, um, if God says it was, you know, it's their time, it's their time. Right? Because God is sovereign over, over life and death. Um, whatever he decides is lawful. Uh, ultimately, why? Because he's the law giver. He's the one that gives law. Um, so Job uh, sums up this truth about God's sovereignty over life and death by saying, Naked I came from my mother's womb, and naked shall I return. The Lord gave, and the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Therefore, if we think about this commandment this way, rebellion against this commandment is ultimately rebellion against God's sovereignty over life and death. So this means that when a person commits an unlawful killing, they're declaring their, themselves sovereign over that person's death. Uh, this also means that if we oppose lawful killings, we are declaring ourselves sovereign over that person's life. And both extremes go against the commandment and against God's sovereignty over life and death. I also said that since this, the ultimate purpose of the sixth commandment is to preserve human life, obedience to it cannot stop at just not killing other people, but doing whatever we can with whatever we have to help others live. This could mean self-defense, or the defense of family and nation. This could mean standing up for the lives of unborn babies. But ultimately, this points to our obedience to the Great Commission to make disciples of all nations. Why? Because our greatest resource as a Christian is knowing God and the one whom He has sent to save the sinners. Namely, all of us. Right? And we can call that the gospel, the good news. That's what we have that we ought to share. So we follow God's example of grace to save when we share the gospel to others, even sometimes at the risk of losing our own lives. That's how much we ought to give. That's how much we ought to go in preserving life. Um, 
And I want you to keep that in mind. Keep the gospel in mind as I will refer to it later in the message as we take up this next commandment. So the seventh statement or the seventh commandment says, you shall not commit adultery. Similar to the previous commandment, this commandment seems simple to understand, but it's very hard to apply. And again, I've been dreading this. I don't want to take this up because it's very sensitive. Can I get my water? It's a very sensitive topic because I know people here have gone through it, who've actually lived through adultery and what it causes. Uh, personal you know, damage, family damage. Um, so that's why you should be praying as you listen. <laughs> Pray for me not to um, say anything out of the bounds of God's word. Okay? Now, why is this so hard? To apply, uh, let's begin by defining what adultery means. How does this use in the Bible? Short answer to the question, what is adultery? It would be that adultery is marital unfaithfulness or infidelity. Right? Simple definition of adultery, as the Bible defines it, is marital unfaithfulness or infidelity. This puts the covenant of marriage at the heart of our understanding of the seventh commandment, right? If it's marital unfaithfulness, we need to truly understand what marriage is. Otherwise, you won't get why God, okay, chose to put this command out of ten. He has ten statements to give to the Israelites on how to govern their lives. Ten. There's so many things that he can say. But he had ten, and he used one for this. This must be really, really important. If it's that important, and our understanding of it you know, depends on how we understand marriage, then marriage must be really, really, really important to God. Right? So now the question is this. Um, by the way, one of the commentaries uh, said that the primary purpose of the seventh commandment is to protect the marriage covenant. Right? To protect the marriage covenant. The question now is this. Why? Why is this here? Why is marriage so important to God that he chose to include as one of the ten statements a command to protect it? Right? Why would he do that? Why would he use one of these commandments to protect marriage covenant let's begin by answering that question by looking at three takes on the meaning of marriage okay i'll give you three takes on what marriage means first take is from my grandfather my lolo john piper okay. <laughs> piper piper says this and i quote the ultimate meaning of marriage is the representation of the covenant keeping love between Christ and his church. Okay. Ultimate meaning of marriage is the representation, manifestation, the covenant-keeping love between Christ and his church. And now Piper's smart, but he's not that smart. He didn't come up with that on his own. Where did he get that from? He got it from the Apostle Paul, which is the second take on marriage. Check out Ephesians 5, 31 and 32. You guys read that. Okay, so Piper got it from there, right? Now Paul is smart. <laughs> he wrote like what, 70% of the New Testament, 60%? Right? He's smart. He's not that smart. So let's take one more take at this. Let's take a look at what Jesus has to say about the importance of the covenant of marriage and why its sanctity needs to be protected. Matthew 5. 27 to 30. You guys read that again. Thank you. 
constitutive sin or that you have only throw it away. For it is better that you lose one of your members than that your whole body go into hell. So for Piper and for Paul, the institution of marriage is a picture that represents the covenant between Christ and the church, with Christ being the husband and the church being his bride. For Jesus, okay, Jesus goes above and beyond the seventh commandment to not commit adultery. Right? You saw that, right? You have heard it said, you shall not commit adultery. But Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount that even if you look at someone with lust, you're already in violation of the seventh commandment. This means, what does this mean? This means that for Jesus, the covenant between a husband and a wife in marriage is something that's so sacred that even thinking about breaking that covenant, just to think about breaking it, is punishable by what? Death? No. What does it say in, in the verses that you just read? Where do you go if you don't cut, take out your eye and cut off your hand? That's causing you to sin. To hell. The punishment is eternal damnation. Not just death. How important is marriage to Jesus? Very important. Right? Check out Leviticus 20 verse 10. If a man commits adultery with his wife, or the wife of his neighbor, both right, shall be put to death. Doug Wilson uh, comments this, and I quote, certainly an adulterer is worthy of death. And this one, this one that hurts, a man who will betray his wife will betray anyone and anything. Adultery is treason against family, and God hates it. So, as you can see, there's so much more to the seventh commandment than meets the eye. And breaking it goes beyond just sexual fornication or sexual lust. Well, we can argue that sex is right there in the middle of this thing, of this understanding of the seventh commandment. Because with marriage comes sex, right? But it goes beyond that, uh, beyond the act of sex. And I believe that the reason why the Bible treats this commandment with utmost seriousness and severity is not because of the act of sex, but it is because of the breaking of the covenant. I think and I believe that God treats this commandment with seriousness is because he hates breaking covenant. He hates to see covenants being broken. And also to show us his seriousness and faithfulness in keeping covenant. You get what I'm saying? In fact, I'm going to argue that keeping a covenant is at the heart of salvation history and the gospel itself. Look at how God describes his relationship with Israel through the prophet Ezekiel. I'm just going to read this for you. I just want you to imagine while we read, okay? This is how God describes his relationship with Israel, and I think he's also showing us uh, salvation, how covenant plays into salvation. It says in Ezekiel 16, verse 4, As for your birth, and as for your birth, on the day you were born, your cord was not cut, you were, uh, nor were you washed with water to cleanse you, nor rubbed with salt, nor wrapped in swaddling clothes. No eye pitied, pitied you to do any of these things to you out of compassion for you, but you were what? Cast out on the open field, for you were abhorred on the day that you were born. And when I passed by you and saw you wallowing in your blood, I said to you in your blood, live. I said to you in your blood, live. I made you flourish like a plant of the field and you grew up and became tall and arrived at full adornment. Your breasts were formed and your hair had grown, yet you were naked and bare. When I passed by you again and saw you, behold, you were at the age for love. And I spread the corner of my garment over you and covered your nakedness. I made my vow to you and entered into a covenant with you 
declares the Lord God. And you became mine. Then I bathed you with water and washed off your blood and from you and anointed you with oil. I clothed you also with embroidered cloth and shod, and shod you with fine leather. I wrapped you in fine linen and covered you with silk. Nobody rescued that baby. They just left that baby out to die. But what did God do? He chose to say. Right? That's what God did. Chose to save and covenanted. Made a covenant with that baby. Right? We can say married. Right? So when we see, what we see there is God freely choosing Israel to be his people. He showed them free and undeserved mercy and established a covenant with them. That's the gospel. Right? We were once dead in our trespasses and sins. We were in the muck. We were in the mire. God pulled us out. Right? Out of His great love for us, He pulled us out and called us to live. How? Through the gospel. Now look at what happens next. Verse 11. And I adorned you with ornaments and put bracelets on your wrists and a chain on your neck. And I put a ring on your nose. Oh, so that's biblical. <laughs> earrings <laughs> earrings in your ears beautiful crown on your head thus you were adorned with gold and silver and your clothing was of fine linen and silk and embroidered cloth you ate fine flour and honey and oil you grew exceedingly beautiful and advanced to royalty then what happened your renown went forth among the nations. But because of your beauty, for it was perfect though, through the splendor that I had bestowed on you, declares the Lord God. Then what happened? But you trusted in your beauty and played the whore because of your renown and lavished your whorings on any passerby. Your beauty became his. Wait, wait, wait before we move on, go back to that. How was the bride now being described? As a whore. What's a whore? No. Prostitute gets paid. She, you're going to see later, this whore pays people to come to her. You trusted your beauty and played the whore because of your renown and lavished your whorings on any passerby, your beauty became his. You took some of your garments, where is that? And made for yourself colorful shrines, and on them play the whore. The like has never been, nor ever shall be. You also took your beauty, beautiful jewels of gold and of my silver, which I had given you and made for yourself images of men. And with them, played the whore. And you took your embroidered garments to cover them and set my oil and my incense before them. My oil, my incense, you set before another God, right? Keep going. Also, my bread that I gave you. I, fe I fed you with fine flour and oil and honey. You set them before them for a pleasing aroma, and so it was, declares the Lord. And what else? You took your sons and your daughters whom you had borne to me, and these you sacrificed to them to be devoured. Where your whoring so small a matter that you should slaughter, that you slaughter my children and deliver them up as an offering by fire to them? Everything that God has given, this woman, she gave to somebody else. Right? 22. And in all your abominations, and your whorings, you did not remember the days of your youth when you were naked and bare and wallowing in your blood. 
23. And after all your wickedness, woe to you, declares the Lord God. You built yourself a vaulted chamber and made yourself a lofty place in every square. At the head of every street, you built your lofty place and made your beauty an abomination. Offering yourself to any passerby and multiplying your whoring. You also played the whore with the Egyptians, your lustful neighbors, multiplying your whoring to provoke me to anger. Behold, therefore, I stretched out my hand against you and diminished your allotted portion and delivered you to the greed of your enemies, the daughters of the Philistines, who were ashamed of your lewd behavior. You played the whore also with the Assyrians because you were not satisfied. Yes, you played the whore with them and still you were not satisfied. You multiplied your whoring also with the trading land of Chaldea and even with this you were not satisfied. How sick is your heart, declares the Lord, because you did all these things. The deeds of a brazen prostitute building your vaulted chamber at the head of every street, making your lofty place in every square, you were not like a prostitute because you scorned payment. There it is. Not even lower than a prostitute. She doesn't want to get paid. She pays. Right? 32. Adulterous wife who receives strangers instead of her husband. Men give gifts to all prostitutes but you gave your gifts to all lovers, bribing them to come to you from every side. Hmm. So after God takes Israel, um, After he took Israel from the muck, she turned away from him and gave what is due to God, to foreign gods. The prophet describes uh, that as the work of an adulterous whore. So at the root of the seventh commandment, the act of adultery, is really giving what is rightfully due a husband or a wife. Whether that be sexual intimacy or intimate love, giving that to somebody else. And the reason why God hates adultery so much is because He doesn't want to see His people be used, abused, and enslaved by these foreign gods. That's why. Stop giving yourself to others. They're, they're going to abuse you. They don't love like I do because I've covenanted myself to you. These false gods have no covenant with Israel. They're all liars. Their promises are worth nothing. But Israel still chooses to share herself, still chose to share herself with them. Instead of saying with the covenant-keeping God of the Bible, the one who brought her from death to life. Committing adultery is a picture of that unfaithfulness. And so look, look, look how God dealt with, with Israel. After doing all that, look at what God does. 34. So you were different from other women in your whorings. No one solicited to play with the whore, to play the whore. And you gave payment while no payment was given to you. Therefore, you were different. Therefore, O prostitute, hear the word of the Lord. What does God say? 
Thus says the Lord God, because your lust was poured out and your nakedness uncovered in your whorings with your lovers and with all your abominable idols and because of the blood of your children that you gave to them, therefore behold, I will gather all of your lovers with whom you took pleasure, all those who love and all those you, all those you love and all those you hated. I will gather them against you from every side and will uncover your nakedness to them that they may see all of your nakedness. So God just said, you know what? You want them? You can have them. You want these gods? Everything I gave to you, you gave to them. You know what? Let me grab all of them and you can have all of them. Seems as though God has finally given up on his people, right? And not just his people, his, his bride. God has rightly judged Israel for her infidelity and adulterous ways. So, what about the covenant? Remember the earlier part he said, I vow, I make my vow with you, I covenant myself to you. What about that? Check out what God does next. 59. For thus says the Lord God, I will deal with you as you have done. You who have despised the oath in breaking the covenant. How does he deal with her? Yet I will remember my covenant with you. In the days of your youth, and I will establish for you an everlasting covenant. There's a difference between making a covenant Breaking a covenant, okay, not breaking, but um, cutting a covenant. And here, look at the wording, establishing a covenant, right? It's not two-way anymore. I'm going to do this new covenant, I'm going to establish for you a new covenant. Then you will remember your ways and be ashamed when you take your sister's both your elder and your younger, and I give them to you as daughters, but not on account of the covenant with you. I will establish my covenant with you, and you shall know that I am the Lord, that you may remember and be confounded and never open your mouth again because of your shame when I atone for you for all that you have done declares God. After giving up his faithless bride into the hands of, these bru of her brutal lovers, the God of the covenant-keeping love took her back, <laughs> took her back and established, established a new and everlasting covenant with her. So whatever she owes... He pays. Prodigal son, right? I gave you everything. You squandered it. Come back. I'll give you more. Everything Israel owed, God paid for. Now, Paul tells the same story in his letter to the Ephesians. The fulfillment of Ezekiel's vision came true in the Lord Jesus Christ. God's new and everlasting covenant was purchased by His blood. That's what Ezekiel was talking about there. When God, when God says, I will atone for everything that you have done. That's what it is, right? Jesus comes down, gives His blood for His bride. And then Paul goes and calls that marriage. Or the mystery of marriage so it shouldn't come as a surprise if your understanding of marriage is that that even though Israel did that to God he still took her back and even made a new covenant if your understanding of marriage is that then it shouldn't come as a surprise that the penalty for adultery is death even hell. Right? Marriage, as the author of Hebrews puts it, 
is to be held in honor among all and let the marriage bed be undefiled. Why? Because marriage is a picture of God's covenant-keeping love. Extreme covenant-keeping love. None of us here could do that. So Jesus declares in Matthew 19, 6, What therefore God has joined together, let not man separate. What does that mean? That means you should not commit adultery. What does that mean? That means don't let another person receive what is due your spouse. Or don't let another person separate what God has put together. That's what it means. That's what the seventh command means. Do not commit adultery because God is a God of covenant-keeping love. Adultery breaks that up or breaks up that picture in marriage. Clear? Good, because this next part will not be clear. <laughs> Application to this is very muddy, right? How do we apply this? Are we going to be like God? You see your wife giving away the, the ring that you gave her, her clothes, feeding the food that you bought to other people, other men. Can you go and say, oh yeah, I know, come back. How do we apply this, right? How do we apply this? And again, this is obviously a very sensitive topic to be given out applications to, right? Some people's situation, there are some people here, uh, some people's situations that come under this commandment. And are not exactly, their situations are not exactly black and white. So how do we apply? It's not like the sixth commandment where we can all kind of relate to. Yeah, don't kill. Easy. What about this? And on top of that, that's why there's so much stress on me right now. <laughs> on top of that, I know people here who are in certain situations or have had certain experiences that this commandment is specifically speaking to. So, it is with, uh, great, with, with prayer and great care that I now share these applications with you. Even the wordings, I have to read two or three times before I say it. So if I go slow, there's a reason. I don't want to miscommunicate anything. Okay? I'm at 34 minutes. So hopefully, don't look at the time. You gave Pastor Luis an hour and a half. Give me an hour. <laughs> okay? <laughs> Let's go. Um, please know that what I'm about to share with you has its foundation on what I just shared um, about how I understand the seventh commandment and it's in no way just my opinions on certain situations. Know that. Um, first, let me talk to the single people. I thought this was the easiest way to do this. Because we're all in different stages of life, right? So let's talk to single people first. Um, whether in a relationship or not. So those of you single, single, like actually single, with no boyfriend, no girlfriend, you're included, okay? So nobody, nobody's going to, I guess blankets, blanket statements. Single people, whether in a relationship or not. But listen to this, more so those who are in a relationship and especially those who are engaged to be married. You know who you are. Those who are engaged to be married. I got one thing to say to you. Marriage is not a joke. I know you see all these TikToks about people getting married. No, those are weddings. Don't get that confused with marriage. Right? That's, that's, that's like Hollywood. Real life is different. Okay, marriage is not a joke. According to Jesus, it's as serious as death. If you fool around in it, <laughs> right? God's original design for marriage is for one man and one woman to be joined together, as Jesus said in the Gospels, so that they are no longer two, 
but one flesh. So that automatically takes out gay marriages. One man, one woman. That automatically takes out polygamists. One man, <laughs> one woman. Who puts that together? God does. That's why what God puts together don't tear apart, right? So you may have decided, and again, I'm talking to single people engaged or single with no relationships. You may have decided to get in that relationship. You may have decided to say yes to his propo proposal of marriage. But the main character in your future marriage is God. He's the one that joins people together to become one. And there's no breaking that up. What God has put together, only God can separate. This is the covenant that you will be making when you get married. So please do not take it lightly. Because God doesn't. If you change your mind after this message, <laughs> here, take your ring back. <laughs> not my fault. All right? That's, this is not my opinion. This is what the Bible says. Right? Don't take marriage lightly because God does it. In God's eyes, there should be no divorce. He didn't divorce. Look what Israel did to him. Right? There should be no divorce. Divorce. The bond of marriage, the, uh, the bond of the marriage covenant may be broken by adultery. It may be broken by sexual immorality. It may be broken by abuse. But unless God nullifies it by death, the covenant remains binding. The marriage covenant is like that. Why? Because the institution of marriage is meant to display God's covenant-keeping faithfulness to His people and Christ's love for His bride, the church. That's why it's like that. No breaking. Because if, if the marriage covenant was meant to be broken, then what assurance do we have that God will not take His word back? Right? You're always sleeping at church. You're not part of the covenant. Right? What, what assurance do we have if that covenant was meant to be broken? But because it's not, we have assurance. Amen? And listen, if adultery is ultimately at its core, I'm still talking to single people, if adultery is ultimately at its core, the giving of something that should only be reserved for a specific person, then sex before marriage is and should be considered an adulterous act. That's why I say, even if you don't have a boyfriend or a girlfriend, you're included. No sex before marriage. Anything outside of the marriage covenant, as far as sex is concerned, is an adulterous act. Sin. God's specific design for the sexual act is for it to be done only within the bounds of the covenant of marriage and only between one man and one woman. Anything outside of that design is a sin. So men, you ought to protect yourself and your future wife against adultery the way God protects the sanctity of marriage. Even before you get married. And I'm putting that responsibility on men. You're responsible. Not that I hold you responsible, but God will. And then at the end, end of the days, and the end times come, judgment day comes, he's not going to call your wife, your girlfriend. He'll call you. Same thing for fathers. He's going to call you. If you didn't teach your son this, he's going to call you. He's going, to call, he's going to hold you accountable. Right? So protect marriage, men, the way God protects marriage. Don't put yourself in a situation where, where you will be tempted. And that goes for single and married. Now, those of you who are married, pretty easy, right? 
Any married people, raise up your hands. How come you're not raising? <laughs> what? <laughs> My wife is sitting there. <laughs> married people. The seventh, the seventh commandment means what it says. You shall not commit adultery. Protect and keep your marriage the way God protects it and keeps it. And here's good news. Okay, I know I've been rambling on about bad news. Here's some good news. Married people, how do you protect against adultery? What is the best way to protect against adultery? And this is good news. Huh? What? One. What one? Oneness. Oneness. Grow your hair. Oneness. That's oneness. Grow your hair. <laughs> How do you protect married people against adultery? And why is it good news? Because God has given us something, provision for this. Right? What? A healthy sex life. Uh, some people, some, the men are like, huh? Protect your marriage by having a healthy sex life. Paul exhorts the church in uh, Corinth saying, don't deprive one another when it comes to sex, except perhaps by agreement for a limited time, that you may devote yourselves to prayer. But then come again. Come together again. So that, what? Satan may not tempt you because of your lack of self-control. The devil knows how to tempt men, and I would say women too, when it comes to sex, because that drive is very strong. Right? And there's a reason for that. Strength is because God gave us that drive. For what? So that we will procreate. So that we will multiply and fill the earth with His image. Right? If you're married and you don't even want to look at your spouse, there's something wrong. <laughs> right? There's a drive there, but the enemy uses it against us. So what does Paul say? Use this against him. In your marriages, have a healthy sex life. The, this act of sex does not only consummate a marriage, it serves to protect it. Solomon gives great wisdom when he says in Proverbs 5.15, check out Proverbs 5.15, drink water from your own sister, flowing water from your own well. What does that have to do with sex? If you're satisfied with the water in your well, you're not going to go looking for different cisterns to drink out of. So Solomon says, drink water from your own, from your own well. Right? Enjoy the water from your own cistern. You will not be tempted to drink from your neighbor's well. Amen. You still enjoy it? Those of you who are married 40 years. <laughs> there's nothing wrong with that I don't know why it's so taboo to you know to discuss this up in the pulpit shouldn't be enjoy it there's something wrong if you don't enjoy it why? because you're going to want to, to, to quench that thirst somewhere else so enjoy the water from your own cistern right? enjoy it so that you will not be tempted to drink from your neighbors. Well, let me also add one more thing to this. Um, sex, in this context, is only the climax. Sex, the act of sex, is only the climax. The build-up to the sexual act is more important. Mm. It's like having anniversaries, right? You don't just celebrate once a year your relationship, your marriage. Who does that? You celebrate it every day. Right? The anniversary is the climax. And you do something special. Like, stay away from each other. No. <laughs> the anniversary is the climax. Sex is the climax. The build-up to that 
That's more important. What do you do each and every single day with your spouse that may or may not lead to sex? That's more important. Amen? Nobody wants to say amen to that. What I mean by that is don't just jump into sex. I know guys do this, right? They treat their wife like garbage the whole week. And then... <laughs> you expect her to just turn over. No! You haven't done anything the whole week. You haven't done your dishes. You didn't walk with her. You didn't talk with her. You didn't. Then all of a sudden... It doesn't work like that. Right? Build up to sex by spending time together. I always say this, go on dates every day if you can afford to. It gets expensive unless you're the type to just, let's just take a walk, that's the date. <laughs> Even that could get expensive. Because you know how women are, right? Let's go for a walk. But I have to have the right outfit. Let me buy new shoes. Let me buy new tights. Let me buy new... But go on dates. There's a whole book on this. Take your wife out on a, on a date. Set apart quality time every day to spend with your spouse. If it leads to sex, praise God. If not, what you have done is you have put in an investment of time that you spent with someone that you definitely, that hopefully you love. And it's going to be worth it. Who here does that? We took a walk, a couple of couples here. I'm not going to mention any names. The, the, me and my wife, always, we always walk. The two couples that we walked with, they don't walk. <laughs> and I'm like, why can't you just walk? Oh, it's boring. Why don't you talk? One of them said, we only end up fighting. <laughs> I'm sitting there like, hmm. Because... When we walk, the walks are quick, even though sometimes we walk for 10, 10 kilometers. Why? Because we talk. <laughs> Don't just walk and just, just to get the walking done. No, use that as an investment of time to spend with your loved one. But during it, talk. <laughs> if it ends up to sex, good. If it doesn't, you just put in an investment in that relationship. That's way better, right? Because when you're 90, I don't think you'll have sex. <laughs> I don't know if people have sex in their 90s, hundreds. <laughs> what are you? <laughs> well, Abraham did. <laughs> he got pregnant, like, right? But what's going to keep that relationship, like, you know, s strong at that point? Is it the sex still? No. It's the time spent, right? So it's best now while you're still young. Think about it. Think about dating and think about sex as strengthening your wall of protection from the temptations that may lead to adultery. Keep reinforcing that wall. Strengthen it with your love for God and for one another as husband and wife. Amen? Amen. And set apart time for that. Young mothers, it's not all about your kids. Those kids will leave you sooner than later. <laughs> Your husband will be there hopefully until you die. Invest more time with them. Amen? Well, whoever wants to invite us for another walk, <laughs> we're up for it. <laughs> they can't even look at me, the people that I walked with. Your legs still hurt? <laughs> Last and not least, anyone, okay, and this is going to be the hardest one. Uh, anyone who, I'm going to talk to those people now who have been divorced, um, those who have been contemplating separation or divorce, those who are separated, what does the seventh commandment mean for you? Well, the Bible is clear. As far as a believer's grounds for separation or even divorce, it has to do with spiritual incompatibility and any form of sexual misconduct. That's what the Bible says. 
Now, due to time constraints, I'm not able to read off all these verses for you and unpack the passages that support this view. But please do look up these verses. I'm going to flash the verses um, for you. Uh, if you can write it down, write it down, because there's a lot of them. Um, so Leviticus 18, 20 to 24. That's one. Leviticus 18, 20 to 24. Uh, Leviticus 20, 10 to 21. And 1 Corinthians 7. 12 to 16. Now, all those verses support the ground that lawful divorce, as far as God's concerned, has to do with spiritual incompatibility and any form of sexual misconduct. Okay? So look up those verses on your own time. If you have any questions, come ask me. Now, what about abuse? The Bible does not specifically talk about abuse when it comes to marriages. Is abuse legal lawful grounds for divorce explicitly no implicitly yes what do i mean by implicit or implied the bible disqualifies abusive men from leadership in the church right first timothy 3 1 to 4 the bible also says that any abuser of power is against the law romans 13 verse 4 so based on those texts my own stand on this Issue is that if you are in a situation when there is abuse happening, I don't care what kind of abuse, sexual, mental, physical, if there's any abuse happening, then separation or divorce, the way I see it, is a provision and mercy coming from God to get you out of there. And it's by the grace of God. Now that's the easy part when it comes to the application of this commandment for those of you who are in that specific situation. That's easy, right? Lawful grounds for divorce. Easy. Now, the more complicated part is for those of you who are separated or divorced or are contemplating separation or divorce, the more complicated part is the issue of remarriage. Should I or can I get married again? Check out Matthew 5, 31 and 32. You guys read that. after this. Matthew 5, 31, 32. But it's also saying, whoever divorces his wife and you give her a certificate of divorce. I say to you, that anyone who divorces his wife except for the love of sexual immorality makes her for me for adultery. And whoever marries a divorced woman from his adultery. Same thing, right? Jesus says. He goes to the commandment first. Moses, Moses told their, the Israelites, right? You can divorce, give her a certificate. But Jesus says, no, no, but I say to you, if you divorce anybody or your wife, except on the ground of sexual immorality, you make her an adulterer. If you marry a divorced woman, you're committing adultery. Okay? If the spouse is still alive. Okay? Uh, 1 Corinthians seven thirty nine. There's, a, there's an out. My husband is dead. But there's the sixth commandment. Don't kill. <laughs> so there's no out. <laughs> That's not an out. Let me go kill my husband. No, you can't kill. <laughs> it's very simple, right? So only in death is the marriage covenant nullified. And that's God, God's God's provision. So biblically speaking, the, there are clear biblical grounds for remarriage. Divorce that is legitimate, as I mentioned earlier, or death. If your situation does not fall under these conditions, then remarriage would be considered as adultery. Say that again. If you're separated, divorced, thinking about separation, your husband's still alive, or your wife is still alive, And you can't. The Bible says remarriage is an adultery. That's an act of adultery. That's a hard stance to take. I have to take it. 
That's what the Bible says. Clearly. Matthew 19, 3 to 9. I'm going to read this for you. The Pharisees came up to him, to Jesus, and tested him by asking, Is it lawful to divorce one's wife for any cause? He answered, Have you not read he who created them? Look at Jesus didn't even answer the question. Well, the answer to Jesus' question to, to the question was no, not no. Right away. Is it lawful to divorce my wife or any or, or your wife at any for any cause? Jesus says, Have you not read that he who created them from the beginning made them male and female? Therefore, and said, Therefore, a man shall leave his mother and his father and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. Haven't you read that? Then he said to him, Why then? Oh, sorry. Okay. So they are no longer two but one flesh. What therefore God has joined together, let not man separate. Haven't you read that? He said to the Pharisee. And then he said to them, why then did Moses command one to give a certificate of divorce and send her and to send her away? He said to them, What? Because of your hardness of heart, Moses allowed you to divorce your wives. But from the beginning, it wasn't so. And I say to you, Jesus said, whoever divorces his wife except for sexual immorality and marries another commits adultery. So again, when you read that passage, there's always a tendency to focus solely on verse 9. And that position would be justified based on the authority of Jesus himself. But that would miss the point that Jesus was trying to make. What's the point? The main point that Jesus was trying to make is that divorce was never supposed to be plan B. There was no plan B when it, come, when it came to marriage. Right? It was only granted by Moses because of your hardness of heart. But from the beginning, it wasn't so. That's the point of the teaching. That's the point of that passage. This teaching, okay, what it does, is, is what it should do, it should solidify the foundation of the seventh commandment, right? That the covenant is not supposed to be broken, right? It should solidify that. How? First, because it tells us that the marriage covenant is so weighty that only death can dissolve it. And again, this is good news for us believers because this is solid ground of assurance to stand on when it comes to God's faithfulness. That's what God intended for marriage to be because it's a picture of His faithfulness. So God's ultimate display of faithfulness that the marriage covenant represents tells us that God Himself will not divorce His people under any circumstance. So if you're divorced... But your divorce was not because of abuse or sexual immorality, and your spouse is still alive. Can you still remarry? No. Bible is clear. Now, if you've already been remarried, but your previous spouse is still alive, and your divorce was not caused by sexual immorality or any form of abuse, should you leave your current marriage? I would also say no. But it says you shouldn't remarry. You're committing divorce. But you got into another marriage. Should you leave that? I would also say no. That's your, that's your second chance to make a good on the covenant. Right? And there's a reason why I say that. Is because the second thing that Jesus teaches us regarding divorce and remarriage in Matthew, is that the marriage covenant is so weighty. Why? Because the blood of Christ is what holds it together. God, by His grace, through the cross of Jesus, established this covenant of marriage with a bride who is or who was unfaithful. Remember? Ezekiel? A bride who was unfaithful and abusive, but He never wavered in His faithfulness. Jesus will never divorce his bride. Piper says this, Jesus never forsakes her. He never abandons her. He never abuses her. He always loves her. He always takes her back when she wanders. He always is patient with her. He always cares for her and provides for her and protects her and wonder of wonders delights in her. In other words, the faithfulness of God in the marriage covenant has the power to what? Forgive. 
and even change anyone. Right? So if you're in that situation, if you're remarried, I don't care if you're remarried once, twice, three times. Now that you've heard this, there's no more excuse. Right? You already know what marriage is supposed to be. Now what about this life that you're living right now that's technically in sin? Well, Jesus says, yeah, you're just like the Israelites. You're unfaithful, you're abusive. But I'm gracious. And I'm going to be faithful to my covenant for those who declare their faith and profess their faith in my son. Amen? That's good news. And that's what marriage is. When Paul says that husbands, um, treat your wives as Christ treats the church, even die for her, that's what it's talking about. Christ died for the church. So those of us who are, you know, in, as, as far as divorce is concerned, who are divorced and remarried, but not lawful divorce, you can still be forgiven. Those of us who are up and down in our spiritual lives, pouring ourselves to whatever is out there, you can still be forgiven. Because God will never divorce. Jesus will never leave his bride. Right? So in other words, the faithfulness of God in the marriage covenant has the power to forgive and again and change anyone. Sure, there will be challenges in your new marriage. But by God's grace, you will not resort to divorce again. I don't care if you're in your third, fourth, fifth. Make sure that that's your last by God's grace. Right? So God, um, through his love and forgiveness, um, by his grace, both you and your new spouse will be able to work things out and to keep and strengthen your marriage covenant. Um, and again, the same goes for those of you who have been married multiple times. So ultimately, adultery, divorce, and remarriage will always carry with its scars of the past relationship. So if you're the one who committed adultery, there's scars there. If you're the one who uh, adultery was committed against, there's scars there. If you got divorced, remarried, there's scars there. But thank God, the Lord Jesus Christ, His sacrifice redeemed those scars. So that instead of those scars reminding us of the hurt and pain and the guilt of adultery, the guilt and pain of divorce, pain and guilt of remarriage, these scars now serve to remind us of the healing power and love of God through the sacrifice of Christ on the cross. This message was not meant for you to go reminisce on what you did wrong in your marriage. No. It's meant to point you that if there are scars that those events cause in your life don't look at the scars and remember the events look at those scars and remember wow god forgives even though i did that i was forgiven i was healed right even though i was unfaithful even though i was abusive i was healed through the blood of the lord jesus christ uh, i want to close with this uh, quote from piper the radical love, sorry, the radical call of Jesus never to divorce and remarry is a declaration of the gospel by which people who have failed may be saved. That's all of us, right? If Christ were not this way, we would all be undone. But this is how true, how faithful, how forgiving He is. Therefore, we are saved. Amen? Let's pray. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord lift His countenance upon you and give you peace. And give you peace. And give you peace. And give you peace.